Excellent. Let's get started with the next slide. Welcome to Web Chat with Minnesota Adult Education. Today is Wednesday, July 20th. Someone just told me the other, I just was listening to the radio this morning and they said, oh, and summer is more than halfway over, which to me was the, just a terrible way for me to start the day. I hope each and every one of you is able to uh, make the most of the summer. I'm trying, but <laughs> I wish I, I wish I was enjoying summer maybe a little bit more. So I'll have to, that'll, that'll push me to enjoy the second half of summer that much more so. Let's go to the next slide. In our, in our conversation today, we, uh, in addition to welcome and introductions, we're going to talk about grants and funding, accountability, high school equivalency or HSE, transitions and partners, professional development, and then we'll make sure we have plenty of time for your questions as well. So, and in the chat, you'll see that Neil has shared the web chat slides with you. So you can download those and take a look at those, uh, at those slides. Um, Let's go to the next slide then. So my name is Brad Haskamp, and I am the State Adult Education Director here at the Minnesota Department of Education. Good to see you all today, and I'm going to transition over to transition it over to Jody. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Jody. My pronouns are she, her, and I am the program quality specialist on the team. And um, I'm not sure if we've got Julie. I'll I'll shoot it over to Julie, or if not, to Astrid. I'm Julie Dinko. I'm the transition specialist. Um, my pronouns are she and her, and I will move it on to Astrid. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Astrid Leiden, and my pronouns are she, her, and I'm the professional development specialist on the team. And I will turn it over to our newest team member. Uh, Brandy Logan. Good afternoon. I'm Brandy Logan, and I am the newest MDE team member, and I am over HSC and accountability. Nice to meet everyone. Hello, everyone. I'm Neil Allard. Um, my pronouns are they, them. Um, I'm the records, communications, and administrative support person on the team. Also, I am tech hosting. If you have any tech troubles, you can chat to me today. Thank you so much, Neil. And just to note that we are in a hiring process to hire uh, another team member. Uh, this would be replacing Alice's position, slightly modified. Um, this position will oversee grants, um, GED records along with Neil and other administrative supports um, with us. So we're excited to have this member join us yet this year as soon as possible. Let's go on the next slide and I, we um, on our next slide, we want to give a little bit more of an in-depth welcome to Brandy Logan. We are so excited to have Brandy Logan join our team here at the Minnesota Department of Education. Uh, Brandy joins us from the state of Georgia, um, where she has worked in, uh, with a lot of WIOA programming and has a long history with uh, uh, adult education and the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act. So we're really excited to have Brandy join our team. She's actually now moved to Minnesota with her family. So that's even more exciting. Um, uh, Brandy, do you want to share a little bit about your role and, and your move here to Minnesota? Absolutely. Thanks so much. So it started off about eight and a half years ago, just being a instructor in a GED class, looking for some extra time and flexibility with my schedule and children. And I soon loved the world of adult ed. And I started to transition from role to role. I went into transitions, actually. And then I went into WIOA outreach coordination to where I worked with those Title I fundings and transitions of students. Um, soon I went into TABE as well as administration and just kind of landed at the state uh, position in Georgia where I oversaw WIOA efforts throughout the entire state. But my love has always been adult ed and the ability to combine that passion with my profession has finally come to a head here in Minnesota, and I'm excited, and it's great to meet everyone. Randy, do you want to talk through your role here in Minnesota, all the things that you're going to be leading with our team? Yeah, definitely. So a lot of your HSE efforts are opportunities here with the state. I'm going to be overseeing GED as well as manager access and requests. 
um, where I'm in um, implementing the rollout for high set here for Minnesota, and then also working through our accountability and strategies. Excellent. Thank you so much, Brandy. And, and as many of you have already seen in previous sessions you've had with Brandy, she's really hit the ground running. Um, and so welcome, Brandy. We're so excited to have you here and part of our team um, and um, really excited about um, all the work that we get to do together. So thanks, Brandy. OK, let's go to the next slide. Just, um, just uh, we thought this would be a helpful reminder to kind of remind folks about and clarify, who do you contact at uh, the adult education team with certain things? So remember that Alice Smith has retired. We're saying that explicitly because we are still getting, e there are people that are still sending emails to Alice Smith's email. So um, we encourage you that, we encourage you to share this information with others in your program or maybe others that may be reaching out to us, but please email mde.abe at state.mn.us if you have any GED verifications, GED record, uh, records requests, if you have any HSE or GED age waivers, um, if you have any GED manager access uh, requests, uh, any, and the August submissions will also go to that email, um, and uh, integrated education and training or IET approval forms will also go to that email address. Um, and then also please email neil.allard at state.mn.us. Please email them if you have any general questions for our adult education team at MDE when you're not sure which one of us is the right person to contact. Um, so please kind of keep that in mind. Um, any of those requests, um, um, they might have gone to Alice or to me in the past, to individuals, but we really encourage you to kind of use this as a guideline for uh, communication using nde.abe uh, at state.mn.us for uh, the GED related requests, the August submissions and the IET approval forms and emailing Neil um, directly if you just have some general questions about adult ed that you're not sure who to direct them to. Thank you. Let's go to the next slide. And let's dive into grants and funding. I'm going to start off and kick it over to uh, Julie. This is just a reminder to everyone who might have applied for an integrated English literacy and civics education grant. Um, there are delays in um, getting these processed uh, and they will um, they are still being processed and we do not have a uh, deadline available for you yet, but um, I will keep people posted as I get information. Back to you, Brad. Thanks, Julie. And in our other federal competition was the Federal Adult Education Grant Competition. Uh, just a little bit of summary for this process. We received 36 grant applications and we are approving uh, 36 grant applications. Uh, some key changes or challenges during this Federal Adult Education Grant Competition was that we were now required by the feds to approve each and every provider within each consortium. And that ended up being a bit of a challenge. It was a big change from what how we did the process the last time around in 2017, um, and it, and it was a challenge to fill to develop and for individual programs to fill out uh, that provider details worksheet. And just note though that this is an ongoing expectation from the federal government, so we will have to do this when we do the competition again next time. So don't think that this is a one and done situation or that you don't have to think about this again. You will need to make sure that you have provider level. Uh, like feedback or, or, or evaluations um, on the outcomes of your programming. And that can be anecdotal information if there isn't provider level detail um, from us at the state level. But just keep that in mind that this is this is not this is not a one time situation, but you'll have you'll be asked to do this again in the future. Um, again, and also this um, this also reminded some folks that they weren't quite clear on what the definition of a provider is, and so that will be that was kind of a lesson learned through this process as well. And a reminder that a provider is an adult is an entity that is receiving adult education funding, state and or federal funding, to provide adult education services, and that means likely also paying or hiring staff directly from that organization, not just being a site 
for adult education program, programming, but actually receiving funding and hiring staff for adult education programming. That is what constitutes a provider. So keep that in mind. Next steps. Um, next steps, um, you will receive um, uh, feedback forms from the uh, Workforce Development Board. So stay tuned. We'll get that information out to you um, here soon. We're still receiving feedback um, from the Workforce Development Board, so we have not been able to send it out yet. Our next federal grant competition is not scheduled for 2028. So you have a six year, uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully six years before we go through this process again. Uh, just note though that this timeline could be if affected or changed if WIOA, the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, is reauthorized and requires a competition earlier than 2028. So just keep that in mind. What that also means is that we are not allowing any new entity, we, we might not allow new entities to, to uh, apply for federal um, adult education grant funding um, in the in the period for until 2028. But that, um, just keep that in mind that this is technically the only competition that's happening until 2028 for these federal adult education grant funds. Let's go to the next slide. In terms of other grants, uh, federal the federal 2021-2022 um, additional ABE funding, also known as the FFR SFRF funding, also known as uh, strengthening of ABE programming grant, also known as FIN 166 grant. It has many. It's the grant with many names uh, and 10 million dollars. Reminder to you all that each of your consortia must spend out all of your fund, all of that funding by August 31st, 2022. Um, some of your grant, some of you have already spent out all the funding by June 30th. That is great. Um, but if you have it, make sure you spend it all by August 31st, 2022. And it, um, if you need an FRF, which is a financial reporting form, please contact Negatari Balance. And Negatari's email is in the chat as well as on the slide here. But please contact him directly if you need an updated FRF to, in order to request um, your federal funds. And this is a, these are fine. This financial reporting form is how you document what you spent. And this is, will be, will be how we pay you. It's like the invoice then that we pay you. And that's, um, is reflective of the budget that you set and what funds you've already spent. Um, and just note that according to the grant amendment document that each of your consortia uh, managers received, FRS must be received by us at MDE by October 15th, 2022. However, ideally those could be submitted by September 15th, if that's possible, but October 15th is the, is the ultimate end date according to your grant amendment. Let's go to the next slide. Another positive, hopefully positive development for each of you is about annual tech fees for 2022-2023. Uh, those have been those have been paid from a central source. Uh, normally, each of you, uh, each consortium receives an invoice from Literacy Minnesota for these tech fees. This tech fee covers each consortium's use of SID and our statewide distance learning or DL licenses. Um, this year, your consortium will not receive an invoice because uh, the Minnesota Department of Education is paying um, is paying all tech fees for 2022-2023 with some unspent previous years uh, federal funding. Um, and so that would be a grant that we actually issue directly to St. Paul uh, Public Schools that would cover the entire cost for everybody. Um, each of you as consortia or every consortium will still though need to sign a contract with Literacy Minnesota for those licenses and the use of SID. So just look for that contract from Literacy Minnesota yet. And also please note that this is a one-time situation. We had some unspent federal money that money that needed to be spent immediately. And this was the best way to use it um, and the way that where everyone could benefit. Um, the plan is that consortia will, will be invoiced for SID and DL licenses again in 2023. So just note that this is um, anticipated to be a one-time um, situation. Marilyn, I see your question in the chat. When can we expect the contract? I'm not exactly sure yet. Uh, Jody, do you know? Uh, good question, Marilyn. I am not sure on those details either. Um, I think that Literacy Minnesota staff will be in touch with you soon to talk about those details. Sounds good. Thanks, Jody. Then let's go to the next slide. And I'm going to turn it over actually to Jody to talk about our state ABE funding. 
Yep, thanks, Brad. So we want to make sure that you all are aware that we have run an initial calculation of state adult education funding for this for the fiscal year that you know started a few weeks ago on July 1. The, that initial calculation is posted on the MDE website the way it is every year. Uh, Neil has put the link to that in the chat. Uh, and uh, so this is the time of year where we ask all consortium managers to take a very careful look at that data and make sure that everything looks correct. Um, on the next slide, Neil, we have um, the link. I just realized just now I meant to go in and make this look a little prettier, but anyway, there you have the link. If you're looking at the PDF version of the slides, you can click through to that link, but it is also in the chat. Um, next slide, Neil. So just to, just to um, reiterate what we are asking at this point is that one you sort of the manager person from the fiscal agent entity for every consortium uh, needs to go in and take a look at that data including um, the contact hour data and the school districts that are listed the membership of the consortium and all the numbers on that report verify that that looks right if you see anything that you don't understand or that doesn't look right please talk to me about it as soon as you can um, if there are any mistakes that are reported, we may have to run a new calculation. And if we do that, because we're taking a total pot and we're dividing it up amongst everybody across the state, if, if, one, piece of, if one piece of the math is wrong, then we have to correct that, then it sort of changes all the rest of the math. However, in other years, there have been errors sometimes that have been found, but it never means a big change for anybody else. So, uh, but just so you know, it is possible that there could be a slight change. Once we have um, sort of passed this period, if there are no errors found, or if we run a new calculation, uh, then we will put a final, um, a final report up there on the MDE website. And once that is there, then we will work through the process of getting out award letters. And the award letters will include your final official amount of state and federal aid. The award letters will go out in August. But in the meantime, you can certainly use what is posted there um, uh, at, in terms of state ABE aid in order to um, get started with your um, budgeting process for the year. I, I'm sure you've already started with your budgeting process for the year, but you can certainly use that as a very close estimate of your award for this year. So next slide. Um, a couple of notes about the state ABE aid for this year. Um, as you all know, you know, we've had some unique circumstances, uh, particularly around contact hours ever since COVID hit. So once again, in this calculation, uh, we used those pre-COVID contact hours, the ones that you reported on table A1. Um, we we used those across the board with one exception. There was one very small program that had uh, more hours on table A, more actual hours than table A1 hours. But for the most part, uh, across the system, those table A1 March 19th to March 2020 hours were still higher than um, any hours, than the hours reported on table A. So we did go ahead and use those pre-COVID hours in this calculation. In terms of the total amount of state aid that we are dividing up, that was essentially level with last year, a little teeny bit higher, but not enough to make much of a difference. But interestingly, the factor that seemed to make the most difference this year is that we saw a population increase a little bit more than other years um, for the state of Minnesota. And because the way the formula works is that the first thing that we do when we're dividing out this pot of money, the very first step is to award out a dollar and 73 cents per resident of every member district to each of the consortia. And so um, that's the first step. And because there are some more residents in the state of Minnesota this year, 
then that actually um, ended up being a little bit higher proportion of the total that went out, that was distributed out that way. And the result is that there was a little bit less left to distribute out into the other buckets. The other three buckets are the contact hours and um, the LEP counts from the member district and the over 25 no diploma counts. So the result of that actually is that the contact hour rate this year went down a little bit as compared to last year. So last year it was 784. This year it is 778. Now, uh, the other thing to keep in mind though, is that many consortia actually weren't getting that full amount anyway, because of the contact hour revenue growth cap, which we have been keeping the same for the last several years because de facto there's no growth. <laughs> we know contact hours are down. So we've just been using those pre COVID um, growth caps, but many programs have been hitting that cap over the last couple of years anyway. Um, so. The formula gets a little bit complicated this year. It is a complicated piece of math, um, but those are some of the highlights of, um, of this, this year. Um, and, oh, Dwayne, excellent question about actual, actual contact hours statewide. At this point, we, have, we don't yet have that um, figure for you uh, to compare, but we'll be working on communicating more about actual contact hour rates over the course of this year, or actual contact hours and how they compare over the course of this year. Which is a good segue to the next slide, actually. So we want you to be thinking at this point um, and to, to know and to be clear about contact hours now and what they mean for future funding. So we've had these couple of years where we have used old hours in order to keep everybody essentially sort of at level, more or less level funding. We have reached the end of the period of time where it's justifiable to do that. So unless something really drastic happens, it is not the plan to reuse those table A1 March 19 to March 20 hours again. So the most likely scenario, what we are looking at, what you should be planning for, for 23-24 funding, is that the hours that you're currently accruing right now from May 1, 2022 to April 30th, 2023, will be the ones that will be used in the calculation of funding a year from now. So what that means is likely, you know, chances are the total amount of state funding available will be roughly the same. However, that shift back to actual hours might mean more variation between in for individual consortia or grantees. In other words, we might expect that some of you will see an increase and some of you will see a decrease decrease and it's a, it's trickier to predict that. So we want you to know that our MDE team is talking and working together with Literacy Action Network or LAN. You know, LAN is the membership organization that represents all of you. We want to help everybody uh, stay informed and be prepared for this shift back to using actual hours in the formula. I want to encourage you to keep in mind that this is a rather complicated math uh, math problem. And so it's not necessarily true that if you have lower contact hours, your funding will automatically be lower. It's more a question of how do your contact hours compare to others' contact hours around the state. So together with LAN, we will be working over the course of this year to help communicate out information about that so that you can be thinking and, and preparing for what it means for next year. All right, let's keep going. Um, also, I want to just give you a reminder that this is the period of the year where you can, uh, you, you can carry over fiscal year 22 funds into this first quarter of fiscal year 23. So if you did not use up all of your state funding by June 30th, please try to use it up uh, before September 30th. 
Uh, we encourage you to use all of that. If it's not used, it gets lost to our system. It just goes back to the sort of the general account of the state of Minnesota. However, the, the key thing to know when you do this is your business office folks have to course code that correctly in UFARS. UFARS is the accounting system uh, and the course code that needs to be used for those funds is 002. So we want to just want to encourage you if you have, if you know that that not all that state funding was spent, be thinking about a special project like Chromebooks or, you know, some kind of tech equipment or, you know, paying a teacher to do a special curriculum development project. Um, so this is the time of year when you can do that. So just a reminder about that. And then just a reminder about the codes. Yep, on the next slide there. Um, so if you are doing that currently, this right now with funds from the fiscal year that just ended on June 30th, you will course code that as 002. A year from now, you would use 003, et cetera. And then uh, just one last update around grants and fundings. Uh, funding. We are restarting the regular five-year narrative process. We took a break from that last year because you all were working on the federal application. So we have an, a cohort of, um, this time it's six consortia that are required to submit a narrative in 2023. So about a year from now. So just a reminder to you folks, if you work for an ABE consortium listed on this slide, um, please have November 2nd marked on your calendar. Uh, we will do a narrative writers workshop on that day. That will be a virtual event, no traveling required. Um, and that will be really the kickoff point for you to get started working on the five-year narrative, which will then be due on June 1st of 2023. So at this point, I'm gonna uh, hand it back to Brad. Thank you so much. I appreciate that, Jody. Um, let's dive into accountability. So first off, we want to let you know that we have some updated Minnesota adult education policies on, on our website at mnabe.org. You can see the full uh, policy, the page, uh, the link to our MNABE policy page there. And Neil has shared it in the chat. Thank you, Neil. The two webs, the two policies that have recently been revised and posted are the 2022-2023 uh, assessment policy and our distance learning policy. Um, we will have a couple of, um, additional policies that will be updated in the next couple months, but for now, these are the two the two most recent policy changes that you'll find on the website. I also want to encourage you as you share these links and kind of about updated policies, please make sure that you share the link that in the chat or to the MNAB policy page. If you link directly just to the policy, the problem is when we update that, you'll still link to an outdated policy, you'll then be linking to an outdated policy. So we encourage you to link to this page, MNAB policy page directly, and then finding the policy on that page. Um, so just, just a little bit of a heads up there. Let's go to the next slide. And then uh, we want to remind you about the August submission reporting. Um, it is due from each consortium Monday, August 1st. Um, and each consortium needs to send the completed August submission reporting document. And Neil has put that in the, the, the template in the chat. Thank you so much, Neil. You, in addition, will need to email the level gains report for 2021-2022 and the effectiveness and serving employer spreadsheet, um, which was um, all emailed out to uh, to folks on June seventh from Neil Allard, and um, those uh, the August submission reporting document, the level gains report, and the effectiveness and serving employer spreadsheet can be sent to mde.abe at state.mn.us, and we've received a couple of them already. So thank you for those that have already gotten that information into us, um, and we um, we look forward to seeing all the rest of yours uh, by August first. A little bit more detail on this next slide about what the six components are of the August submission reporting. Um, there is that level gains with post-test report for all ABE participants. That's what that report is called in SID. And so that's something you can download to SID and attach in uh, Microsoft Excel format. 
We also, um, you'll need to complete the annual volunteer information report. That can be done as a consortium or it could be done by multiple members of your consortium, depending on um, how you decide to break that out. In addition, uh, there's the effectiveness in serving employers for 2021, 22. Uh, and that's a, a Microsoft Excel template that we sent out, a spreadsheet that we sent out. And note with that, that um, there's slight changes to the, this document from the prior year. Uh, Deed would like us to categorize all of our engagements with serving employers um, under one of their categories. So please note that that's kind of a change from last year to this year. Um, and then we're asking for each consortium to estimate their IET workforce training costs using ABE or ILC, IL, IELCE, Integrated English Literacy and Civics Education Funding um, from Ju July of 2021 to June of 2022. So looking back at the past year and sharing your consortium one-stop contributions and um, just letting us know how much uh, you contributed to the one stop. That's our career force centers and that career force system, our workforce development uh, boards, uh, and verification of your consortium state ABE aid calculation for two, uh, two, uh, fiscal year 23. And just noting that everything looks good or that you've already talked to Jody that something looks off with your estimate. Please do not wait if something is off with your estimate. Do not wait until the August submission to let us know that something is wrong. Please contact Jody as soon as possible if you see something that is incorrect with your consortium state ABE aid calculation. Let's go to the next slide. And we also have some new statewide targets for our adult education system. These are perf annual performance outcomes or goals that are set with, with OCTE, which is through with US Department of Education. OCTE stands for the um, Office of Career Technical and Adult Education. And this creates goals or targets for our statewide adult education system. These are annual targets, so the numbers change every year. Um, and they're negotiated once every two years um, in connection with every state uh, WIOA plan revision. So we just negotiated new targets this year or this spring. Note that targets have changed significantly due to COVID. So you can see here, we can go to the next slide. We can, um, we can see here the new targets um, for measurable skill gains, 27.5%. Um, for the next year, then it's 28%. Neil has shared this chart and we, it also has some additional information for you um, on, the, uh, on the handout. So please download this handout. This handout is also at mnabe.org under accountability. Um, and our employment rate, 34.3% uh, and then 35% uh, for employment rate one year after exiting. It's 35.4% and then 36% for 23-24. Um, and then for median quarterly earnings, $6,190 per quarter um, for each exited participant that has a, that has a job. Um, and then $6,200 for the year after. Um, and then credential attainment rate, 19.3% for this year is our goal. And for next year, it'll be 20%. So keep these targets in mind. Um, note that measurable skill gain is the one that you can more immediately see and the one that you can more, uh, like more immediately address. But it's also important to note with these employment outcomes and these other WIOA outcomes, you'll want to be thinking about what are the credentials, the sort of the uh, industry recognized credentials that we're offering. Um, how do like how are we helping or encouraging those learners that are going into employment um, either during their time with us or after their time with adult ed? How are we making sure that they are how are we helping to make sure that they are successful with their employment, um, getting a job and, and being successful in that job. Um, and Trace, you asked to meet the employment rates, it means we need uh, social security numbers. That is correct. The employment outcomes um, are based on social security numbers. So if you're not entering, so if you're for any, every individual in our system that does not have a social security number entered, it comes up as a, as if that individual does not have a job, which hurts our percentages or our outcomes potentially, um, or they can't be counted as a success, I should say. So yes, try, the connection with this is make sure that you're documenting as many social security numbers um, in SID as possible for individuals that are willing to share that information. And our goal statewide is um, like 70 to 80%. That is our hopeful goal. 
Um, and the MSG rate is for overall for your entire program. So that includes ABE levels and ESL levels, Eric. Yep, good question. Let's go to the next slide. A little bit more about these MSG targets, or MSG stands for Measurable Skill Gain. Note that they that they count for the July first, twenty twenty two, to June thirtieth, twenty twenty three. That's where we'll be. We'll be. We will be held accountable um, for that twenty seven point five percent. And for the next year, uh, it will be 28%. Note that those targets have come down significantly, as we said, because of uh, COVID. They were our target for this 2021-2022 uh, was 44%. And so you see that this is really reflective of just how much uh, the disruptions with COVID have really hurt our measurable skill gains over the last couple of years. And so that has lowered our targets with the federal government. And there are connections with these MSG targets that pertain to other areas. And I'm gonna turn it over to Jody to talk more about how this connects then to program improvement. All right, thanks. Um, thanks, Brad. Yeah, uh, Karen, good question. We That is correct. There is no longer a target at each level, just those combined targets for all the levels together. So we want to put program improvement back on your radar. Uh, we have not been doing a formal program improvement process for the last several years because of obvious reasons, um, but we are looking to the future and sort of rebooting that process. So um, as a reminder, if you've been around for a while or as new information, if um, you're relatively new, what program improvement is, it's a technical assistance process that helps ensure that our statewide ABE system can reach those federal targets. And specifically, one of the ones we, are, we focus on here is those MSG rates. Uh, next slide, please, Neil. So um, if consortia have to go through the program improvement process, uh, we and um, that can happen if a consortia has low performance on accountability measures such as MSGs. Um, it may be a requirement in that case to participate in program improvement. And what that looks like typically is um, attending a workshop, doing some program improvement planning, and then uh, working alongside our MDE team to get some extra technical assistance. So, um, on, yep, on the next slide, uh, we wanna remind you that the program improvement process really kind of kicks off with the report card. And um, we will, our team will be releasing a report card for 2022, uh, sometime this fall, hopefully early fall. Uh, this is a screenshot of the 2021 report card just to show you what it looks like. It just you know, shows where your consortium kind of ranks um, in terms of the NRS target and also in terms of um, comparison to other consortia. Next slide. So just to remind you, there will be no program improvement process this year. So when you get the when you get the report card this year, no need to worry. Uh, you will there will be no one placed in program improvement in the current program year. However, it will give you a chance to see how your MSG rates and your post testing rates compare um, with those federal targets and with other consortia. So definitely pay attention to the report card, but just know there won't be any program improvement this year associated with that report card. Then um, approximately a year from now, yep, next slide, we will release a report card for 2023. And then that is the point at which some consortia may be flagged to participate in program improvement. So on the next slide, I, we kind of explain what we mean. So um, what we mean by flagged is that it is possible that your consortia could be flagged to uh, to be required to participate in program improvement if you fall if your consortium falls significantly below those program improvement benchmarks uh, for measurable skill gains and for post testing rates. And um, just an acknowledgement of kind of next steps. We want to put this back on your radar because 
uh, these, the measurable skill gains that your students are earning now are the ones that are going to be reflected on the report card in 2023. Uh, so we want you to know that program improvement is eventually coming back. However, we also don't want to cause any panic and we want you to remember that that next program improvement process is still more than a year away. And your next step is to really be watching for the 2022 report card and kind of figure out what, uh, what kind of information that gives you. Um, and over the course of this year, we'll continue talking about this on web chat. And um, I just want to acknowledge that um, we, we may be adapting this process a little. It's been a couple of years since we've um, since we have run a program improvement process, so it may change a little over the course of this year exactly what the parameters are um, and exactly what targets are included, but just wanted to get it on your radar at this point um, that it will be happening. Um, I do see your question, Penny, about getting an MSG at ABE level six. Um, the, the definitions of MSGs are set at the federal level. So unfortunately, we do not have, um, we, we don't have a way to negotiate those specifically for the state of Minnesota. Um, now, that being said, we absolutely recognize the importance of the work that you are doing with those students in ABE level six and working with community colleges. So that is, of course, not a reason not to, you know, do that work and prioritize it. But we do have to take the MSG definitions as they are given to us by Octay and the, and the federal government. And those are the targets that we are held to according to those definitions. So, and Eric, in terms of your, the specific, um, the specific mark where that flag is set. Uh, yeah, I think I, I, you maybe I, hmm, I can't remember for sure. I know what you're getting at that we sort of set it a little ways below the target. We will probably do something like that again. But now that the target is significantly lower, I think it remains to be seen exactly where we will draw that line. So that's why uh, that's the kind of thing we will continue to update you on um, over the course of this program year. So thank you for those questions. I think at this point, uh, we have Kaya on board from LAN who, um, has some information for you. So we're gonna rearrange a little bit and I'm gonna hand it over to Kaya. Hi, yeah, thank you. Um, so like Jody said, I am Kaya Bergen. I am uh, the chair for marketing and membership with LAN. And uh, LAN and MBE put together a toolkit um, that I'm going to give an overview on that is uh, designed to be used for programs across the state of Minnesota to do outreach and um, kind of promote what you're doing with your programs. So I think we can jump to the next slide. Um, yeah, and so I'm gonna overview that for you. Uh, all of the materials that are in this toolkit can be found on the LAN website. Um, and I'll put the link for that in the chat. Um, and they are sort of open source use. So feel free to use them as they are or to edit them, do what you want with them. Um, I'll go over what we have in the toolkit. So um, it's designed to inform people about ABE, to recruit learner learners, and also to be used to connect with potential partners. So some of the things that are in this toolkit are going to be um, tools for you to brainstorm what you're already doing with outreach and sort of taking stock of what your outreach potential is. Um, this is, there are tools that we'll look at that are for kind of your on foot outreach, like what are you doing directly in your communities and then also your digital outreach. Um, and then there are some templates for you to use to create flyers. It's designed to be accessible kind of from like a ground level up in terms of what people's tech skills are and capacity are for design. Um, and then there are a series of stock phrases that have been translated that we'll take a look at to be used for um, reaching populations that might not um, 
otherwise be reached in English. And then we also were able, and this was through our partnership with MDE, to do a series of stock photography that we'll give a quick overview on. These are photos from different ABE sites that can be used in your promotional materials, um, flyers, brochures, and online on your websites. Um, so yeah, I'll go into some details about that. Um, we can go on, I've got some extra slides. <laughs> so the first is some of those outreach planning tools I talked about. So this is an example of one where you can, um, as a team or as an individual or as a consortium sort of take stock of what are the areas where you can be doing on foot promotion? Um, this is for flyering. There's another for tabling as well. Um, and the idea is that each program has a different capacity to do outreach. Some of you uh, might have, you know, people who's got have portions of their time dedicated to this. Otherwise, you might have someone who's got a full time job and is trying to layer this in. And so the idea is to scale this to what works best for you. Um, but this is an example of how you can think about what are the libraries, the coffee shops, the schools, the workforce centers that are near you? How close are they? Do you have a contact at those sites? And then decide what kind of level of priority is a site like this for you, given what your program offers and maybe what your partnerships are and your capacity are, and then develop a plan for how you can do outreach. Um, so there's this form, and then, yeah, we can go to the next one. Um, there's also a digital outreach checklist. This is a way for you to evaluate what you are already doing with your online presence. So if you have a website for your program, then you can use this checklist to sort of see how accessible is it, um, and what are some ideas for things that you could do to, like, oomph it even more if you're already doing well. Uh, you score yourself and then uh, based on what your score is, there are some recommendations for other things you could do. Um, there's also a Facebook evaluation. Uh, it's for Facebook just because that's the most popular social media platform, but you could adapt this if you find that a lot of your participants are using a different social media platform, but thinking about how your digital presence is reaching people. Um, and then, after kind of doing evaluations and figuring out what your plan is, you can use these templates to create flyers and social media posts. So the templates come in two forms. They are, um, there are stock PowerPoint formats. So if you download the PowerPoint form from the website, you'll get something that looks like this, where you can just type in the basic information about your program and insert a picture. Um, this is designed to be super, super accessible if you don't have a lot of time or you don't have a lot of tech capacity. Uh, if you want to kind of get into design more or maybe you're already using some other things, um, then we also have some Canva options. So you can see here, this is sort of an example of what your flyers might look like if you were doing the um, PowerPoint mode. You can change the colors, you can change the fonts, you can do whatever you want. And then um, if we click again, these are some examples of what you can do if you want to use the Canva templates. So those are um, links. You create a free Canva account if people, I know a lot of people are familiar with Canva. This was a request um, for, for these kinds of templates. But if you're not familiar with Canva, it's a free design website. You can choose to purchase like a fancier version, but these were all made in a free format you create a free account and then you can click on the links that are in this toolkit and they will open up um, stock versions of what you see here in these pictures and you can plug your information and pictures in to make something. Um, so after you've made your flyers, you've got your plan for outreach, you've got your graphics for social media, then the other thing in the toolkit, and we can keep going, is it has a series of translated stock phrases. This is something I'm really excited about. I've already used it a lot for what I've been doing. Um, but these are uh, just stock phrases and words with the idea that you can kind of cobble together um, things that are specific about your program in different languages. So you can see the list of languages that we have here. We've got Spanish, Somali, Hmong, uh, Karen, Simplified, Chinese, Vietnamese, Romo, Amharic, Russian, French, um, Dari, Pashto, and Ukrainian. Um, 
obviously every program's a little different. So if you have a program that's got like some really specific things, it won't cover it. But you can see in this picture, there are days of the week listed. Um, there are ways to register or contact and sort of basic descriptions of what your classes might be. Um, there are also some phrases that are specifically for registration. So if you have an online registration form, or even if you're doing a paper registration, um, you probably can't get like a complete, um, like the, the complete series of things. There aren't questions about like, um, if somebody is on a specific kind of government aid, like we didn't translate SNAP, but it does ask if you're receiving public assistance, it does have some of those stock phrases that you need for your state entry. Um, and then from, um, and then the idea is that you translate your flyers or your registration forms. And then the last thing uh, is we have a set of stock photos. So these were taken by Uh, shout out to him and a shout out also to all of the ABE sites that worked with us for it. You can see we uh, visited Hub Center, we went to Lakeville area schools, um, we went to the International Institute to uh, take photos of their nursing assistance classes, and then we were also at ThinkSelf. Um, and these are all photos that can be used. There are uh, I think around a hundred of them um, that you can use in your flyers, you can use in your social media. All of the students uh, were compensated for being in the photos and then we explained their purpose and they like signed off so they're aware of how they would be used um, and that they are designed to be um, public use photos to help promote adult education around the state of Minnesota. Um, so yeah, we're really excited about those and uh, it, hopefully people are able to use the toolkit. If you want to download the whole thing, you can. There's a write-up that explains all of the pieces I just talked about, um, but it's also split out on the website. So if you just are excited about one part, you can ju just download that or select that. Um, but yeah, uh, any questions? Well, if you do end up having questions or you go to the website and you look at it and you're like, oh, Kaya, you talked about something and I can't find it, please feel free to uh, shoot me an email. Um, I'll put my email in the chat. Um, and uh, yeah, I hope that it's useful to people. And thank you to um, Tom and Carla at Literacy Action Network and also to uh, Jody and Brad and everyone at MDE for working together to put this and uh, letting me help with it because it was fun. So, yeah. Yeah, they are all on the LAN website. Um, so if, yeah, if you go and I'll put the link back here in the chat, um, but if you go to this link right here, you'll see uh, where you can download everything. Thank you so much, Kaya. Thank you for being here today to highlight some of the wonderful tools and resources that are available through the toolkit. Yeah, thank you so much for having me and thanks for letting me jump in. Um, I know you've got a lot of things to cover, so thank you. We're glad you could be here. So this is the high school equivalency portion, or HSC. And again, my name is Brandy Logan, is part of that new ABE member. And we're just gonna talk about some opportunities and services of HSE affiliation. So the first thing that we want to reiterate again is that if you have records requests for verifications, diplomas, transcripts, age waivers, even GED manager access, um, anything that's pertaining into HSC efforts, please send those emails and questions to the mde.abe at state email because that's going to give access to our entire team and not just one specific person. So you'll have multiple people being able to try to answer those questions at a timely manner for you. That's going to lead into updating your records and request of the age waivers. So those waivers have been updated, the forms at MDE's 
website. You can click on this link and find that website, but also please check your program's website and make sure that your links as well as your documents are uploaded and um, updated as well. And then again, make sure to communicate the update to your staff. And if you have any questions or anything that normally goes to Alice Smith, please start to send all the communication to the nde.abe email. So the high school equivalency, the subsidy code is back up and running and reactivated. So testers can get $10 off their first time taking each subject with a maximum of $40 off. There have been questions before in the past that if someone has purchased previously their entire GED battery and paid out of pocket, can they get reimbursed? And sadly, that is not the case. They need to use the subsidy code before purchasing each individual content or subject area. So, um, and they get one per subject. Highlights are coming soon for that high set pilot. So we've decided that we are going to do, offer a pilot of high set test uh, centers starting in early October. And then the goal is, is learning from that pilot to where we are ready to completely um, roll out the state in January for any and all test centers that want to be offer high set testing along with GED or a brand new test center. There is an application process for that on a Google form. It's been emailed to our test centers. Another email will go out later next week just for those individuals that might have overlooked it or were out on vacation. Um, once you complete the application, your information will be uh, moved forward down the process line and then we will start identifying those test centers to be part of the pilot. Next part of high set that we want to talk about is the vouchers. So some of you guys might have heard that there are high set official practice test vouchers or OPTs going out. We do have an amount of vouchers that we are able to use for staff and ABE throughout the state. And we are offering those to each consortia. I'm going to be emailing individual consortiums out and asking you how you want to distribute those vouchers and explaining the process. We also have an additional 3,700 vouchers that Atlas has purchased for us. And so those as two will be part of ABE staff vouchers accessible. But our goal is some of those vouchers to have towards the end where students can get a voucher for one of the practice tests as we start to roll out the pilot. So please know that there is many vouchers available. Those opportunities to get them will be coming up. I'm actually gonna be sending out some communication later on this week about how to obtain those and how they work and how to implement everything. And lastly, we're gonna just talk about the timeline. I just wanted to give you guys just an, uh, an opportunity to physically see what this high set implementation looks like. Of course, we're doing our web chat today where we're speaking about some opportunities coming up, that voucher distribution, and then going into the Summer Institute. We're also going to be doing some debriefing and discussion webinars where we're taking individuals from a target group who have taken some of the OPTs and subject content areas and giving us their feedback so we can start to really create some data and understanding about the high set and the practice test. We'll be putting out some series of articles and screencasts and collaborating with corrections as well. And then we're going to be going into specific content areas webinars where individuals get to bring their questions as well as their concerns or anything else that has to do with the high set. We'll be delivering a lot of that information at the fall South and North regional conferences. And then that pilot is going to begin early in October. Um, there's a three week series in October into November that actually is going to be a deep dive and high set staff team is going to help present those deep dive webinars where they're going to be able to really take about a 90 minute um, concentration in each area and we'll be able to really focus on some subject content. Then of course with logistics and student advising and then of course in January our goal is for the state rollout. 
And I know it's a lot of overcast information, but we just wanted to give you some, some targets and as well as some dates and times and really see what we're doing with the high set implementation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Brandy, and thank you, Neil, for uh, bringing up the slides. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to give some transition and partner updates. The first update I'd like to make is that um, the Office of Higher Education is coordinating the Minnesota Future Together grants. Um, I mentioned these previously. And these grants are available for people who are interested in going into fields that are um, in high demand, and they can be certificate or diploma. Um, uh, it can be the goal. It doesn't have to be an associate degree or a bachelor's degree. And they are available for refugees and part-time students. So if you have anyone uh, that you're working with in your program who is interested in post-secondary or interested in further education, please let them know about uh, this uh, grant opportunity. I also want to mention that uh, we are in the midst of an ability to benefit pilot. Uh, ability to benefit is kind of the process that's used to help individuals that may not have a high school diploma or GED enter into post-secondary work. And it allows them to do that and receive financial aid uh, to do that. That's the main thing. It turns on the federal financial aid to support them while they're going to, um, or while they're taking their coursework. Um, they cannot take developmental education courses as um, if they are enrolled as an ability to benefit student. So this is a pilot with Minnesota State. And the, if you go to the next slide, it shows kind of the timeline. We are waiting for the statewide process to be approved through our federal office. That probably won't be happening until January. So we've bumped out the timeline a little. And what's going to happen in the fall is some professional development around ability to benefit. And we'll be working with some Minnesota State campuses and some adult basic education programs, working together to identify some career pathways that might be best suited uh, for learners um, who might or who are interested in this option. Um, to get their post-secondary uh, certificate, but also their high school diploma. And then in after May or June, once the pilot has ended, starting in the fall, we're going to bring on more campuses. Um, and many of you may already have heard about this. Maybe your campus has already contacted you in regards to this pilot. And then on the next slide, I want to remind people that we are in the midst of the guided self-placement pilot, which is allowing learners to transition to Minnesota State campuses without having to take the Accuplacer exam. They're trying to take more of a holistic approach of a learner's abilities um, and uh, kind of their grit and other things that might might make them a good candidate for college other than the Accuplacer score. And that has been used by, I think the majority of campuses and that's still um, being considered a pilot in the evaluation I, um, in September of 2023 will be used to determine if this is going to be an ongoing um, process that Minnesota State will be using. So just again, this is a good opportunity if there are students in your program who are interested in post-secondary education at a, a Min State two-year community college or four-year college or the U of M to take advantage, or not the U of M, to take advantage of this. 
I also want to announce that they, we are piloting some online statewide training courses. Um, these are courses that will be offered to any um, adult basic education learner who may be interested in it. Uh, we are currently developing this as it is rolling out and we're trying to implement it. We're trying to piggyback on the momentum that uh, happened during uh, the pandemic. And the courses that will be offered are Healthcare Core, Microsoft Office Specialist, Parapro, and Tees. And how this will work is that the a consortium that refers a learner to these courses will be able to count the contact hours for that learner attending them, uh, attending the classes. Um, you, there will be more to come on these online statewide training courses, um, but it is a good opportunity to learners for learners who may not uh, have the time or the resources available at a smaller program to participate in these trainings. Next slide, please. And then there are three one-page briefs that will be coming out. We contracted with an individual, or I should say Minnesota Association of Workforce Boards contracted with an individual to create three briefs that highlight these newer programs in adult basic education um, around adult uh, uh, career pathways, integrated education and training and workplace literacy. And these are designed to really promote these as um, new services. They're, although they aren't new services in a lot of the population's mind or in many of our partners and our community partners, they still think of adult basic education as only offering English language classes and GED prep in a classroom environment. And we are so much more than that and we have um, expanded uh, to workplaces, to a variety of different uh, service delivery models. And this is a way to highlight what we're doing and show people what we can do now in adult basic education. Those will be coming out hopefully by the end of August. Next slide, please. Memorandas of understanding are currently being reworked. Um, DEED has identified an individual who has been going out to the local workforce development areas and presenting um, information regarding the MOUs. As many of you know, the infrastructure agreements are a part of the MOU and that has been a tricky part of the MOU in the past. And it still continues to cause um, some headaches because the guidance has been um, uh, different uh, that we received over the years. And so we're hoping um, that they are reach, we're hoping that your local workforce development board or your one stop is reaching out to your ABE, to you as ABE partners and included in the initial development of the MOU. Instead of just having you sign the paperwork, uh, we, they are pushing that everyone comes to the table and designs this together. So that's a heads up. If ever, if anyone has had this happen, just put it in the chat. I'd like to hear where it's happening um, and more to come on that as well. Next slide, please. And this is just a, a reminder for an adult citizen citizenship education program webinar. Uh, this was just a recent email I received from um, the US Citizenship and Immigration Services Office. And if you're interested in it, you can register at the link provided. And that those are the updates that I have. Does anyone have any questions? Or maybe we don't have time. Maybe we just move on to professional development, Astrid. Julie, we do have a couple questions. I, I think we oh, have time okay. to take them. Um, they're okay. both about the online statewide classes. Angie's wondering where uh, she can find the classes. Um, thank you for the question that is still being developed. We're still working on 
uh, the rollout of these once they are all, um, once we have an understanding of when they start, who's teaching them, et cetera, et cetera, we're going to do promotion of this. And so all programs will receive informa information regarding when they start and how to enroll. Okay, great, thanks. The, that was the other question was about a target start date for those. Yeah, I'm hoping, uh, depending, because they're in various um, forms, some people already have it set to go and others are developing it. Um, but I know that as soon as like the end of August, I think there are two that um, may begin. Another question coming in, Julie, are they synchronous classes or asynchronous classes? <laughs> they vary. <laughs> so these are all great questions. And this is what I mean that it's all we just we're pulling it together. There's a lot of questions we need to answer as a group a team of these individuals who will be providing the classes. So um, more information Thank you, right? to come. Yep. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Julie. And then uh, just to draw people's attention to the chat. Um, if anyone's interested in the healthcare core, that's an open enrollment self-paced core. And you can chat to Meg Patridge about that. She's put her email address in the chat. Thanks, Meg. Okay, let's move to professional development then. Thank you, Julie. We wanted to share a few updates about upcoming professional development opportunities um, and resources that are out there. The first announcement is just um, a call for applications to join the 2022-23 Racial Equity ADE and Partners Advisory Group. So our Racial Equity and Adult Education Supplemental Service uh, Grant staff are looking for people to join um, this team for the second year of work, we had an excellent team working this year under the grant um, to start collecting data around racial equity in adult education. That work around data collection will continue in this coming year and the um, REAP advisory group will have the opportunity to support that work as well as starting to analyze the data that has come in and start to look to make recommendations to the adult education field based on that data. So the deadline has been extended to this Friday. So if you have an interest in getting involved um, statewide around racial equity work, really encourage you to apply. They are looking for some additional applications. And thank you, Neil, for putting that information in the chat. Let's go to the next slide. Also wanted to remind folks um, about the updates to our Minnesota Adult Education Volunteer Training Policy that went into effect last fall. So as a reminder, all volunteers who work with adult learners, with, with a couple of exceptions uh, for the policy, are required to receive either the 12-hour Foundations of Adult Education Tutoring training or the foundations of volunteering in the adult education classroom that's four hours. Um, there's a link in the chat to learn more about those trainings. The Literacy Minnesota staff has been hard at work developing a variety of delivery models for those trainings, both synchronous and asynchronous online opportunities and um, looking ahead to this current year, some more in-person training opportunities um, starting up again. Um, also want to just let folks know that as of July 1st, um, you do need to be recording all of the training that's required in those volunteer training standards in SID. And if you have any questions about how to do that, you can contact the SID uh, staff at the SID support email. Let's go to the next slide. So our institute is right around the corner. It's going to be held virtually again this year, August 18th and 19th. Um, there is a call out currently for poster sessions. Um, those are due July 29th. And just like last year, the poster sessions will be um, short recordings of um, highlights of things that are working in your programs, in your classrooms. This is a wonderful opportunity. If um, someone isn't quite ready for a presentation, um, a live presentation, this is a nice way to um, get their feet wet with presenting and sharing what's working in your program. Um, registration um, deadline is August 12th. And I think link, uh, Neil is going to put that registration link in the chat. There's asking where to register. Um, so make sure you get registered in time for the conference. I 
And Neil, if, if that link isn't, okay, great. Thanks, Neil. Um, let's go to the next slide. Um, Want to make sure that everyone knows that there is an upcoming opportunity for um, a TVM certification webinar. So just as a reminder that certification webinar is part of a larger certification process that includes going through um, our distance and blended learning basics for Minnesota adult education online course. There are uh, a number of general modules and then a specific TVM module. Um, and then teachers need to complete a sample TVM lesson, attend the certification webinar and have their lesson approved before they are certified to use the teacher verification model. Um, you'll find a link in the chat to the distance learning website page where you can learn more about the teacher verification model process and um, get more information about that certification webinar if that's something that your, your staff are interested in. We are really excited that the North Star Digital Literacy Foundations course um, has been revised. Um, the previous one was getting a bit outdated and Elizabeth Bennett from the distance learning team has done a lot of work to bring that course up to speed. A draft version of this self-paced course is currently available through Literacy Minnesota's online training portal. Um, the distance learning team is in the process of making some final edits and, and revisions, so there will be an official launch at Summer Institute. So um, if your staff have not received basic training on how to integrate those required North Star Digital Literacy Standards into instruction, this is an excellent opportunity for them to learn the basics and get some tips for how to integrate that into their instruction. Let's move to the next slide. Thank you. ABE Foundations, um, formerly New Staff Orientation, um, is going to be offered again this year at a distance. Um, there is an online course and a webinar series that will be offered again to complement that online course. So you can see a list of some of the, the topics that are covered, both in the course and the webinar series. So the idea is that you would have new new staff or those who want a refresher go through that online course and then attend the webinars to get some um, uh, a review of the topics have the opportunity to ask questions about the content and apply some of what they're learning in the course we've gotten really great feedback um, past couple of years um, around this webinar series and the opportunity to, to interact um, real time with um, leaders in the field around those topics. Another exciting project um, coming this year, um, the ACES TIF is getting a refresh. Um, for those of you who, who have been working in the field for a while, um, it's almost been 10 years. We launched um, the ACES uh, Transitions Integration Framework back in 2013, and a lot has happened since then. So uh, Stephanie Summers, the Atlas ACES coordinator and an advisory team of some folks from around the field are gonna be working um, this fall to update and revise the TIF um, and some of the related resources, the lesson plans and other resources um, connected with, with the TIF. Um, and look at some different digital formats for um, sharing that information. So uh, stay tuned for more information. There will be a TIFF 2.0 webinar series coming this winter and spring. You've got the dates here. We are also planning um, at the North Regional to offer a TIFF refresher um, to get people um, familiar again or, or for new staff to get an overview of the transitions integration framework and be thinking about how uh, those skills can be integrated into your programming. So we're really excited about that project. Mark your calendars. There are um, some great uh, PD events coming up this um, year. Some of them will be virtual. We will also be starting to return to some in-person uh, programming. We have an excellent ABE Math Institute coming up on September 24th. We've got 
um, a math superstar, Dan Meyer, um, who will be leading a keynote and a morning workshop for us. And then we'll be having breakouts in the afternoon. So encourage any of your staff who do any sort of numeracy instruction um, to attend that event. We're looking forward to gathering again in person at, for our South and North Regionals um, coming up in Mankato and Walker. Um, the CTE Works Conference um, will be November 1st with both an in-person and a virtual option. We hope to be holding our fall manager meeting in person on November 10th, details um, to follow around that. And then a couple of our standard conferences, the Support Services Conference and the Volunteer Management Conference um, will be held virtually. The English Learner Education Conference will be in person at the St. Paul River Center. Language and Literacy Institute, um, looking forward to a two-person in-person event in Bloomington, and then um, planning for a spring virtual statewide conference, April 28th. The feedback that we've received over the past couple of years is that some of you are thrilled to have the opportunity to attend regionals and conferences virtually and find it to be um, really accessible. Others of you are really eager to gather with colleagues again in person. So we're um, trying to um, offer a bit of both and thinking really strategically about the best fit for each of these events in terms of a delivery model. Brad, thank you for the um, correction around the Summer Institute date. Sorry for any confusion there. Let's go to the next slide. Also, as we're looking ahead to the coming year, I want to encourage you to use our FY23 PD dates document um, that is linked from the Minnesota Adult Education PD catalog to plan ahead. We use the Atlas PD calendar as a place to list registration and information about um, events that have registration that is currently open, but we are planning ahead for the entire year. So if you want to see a snapshot of everything that has been scheduled to date, um, encourage you to bookmark that FY23 PD uh, events. Um, I know that some managers have used that as a, a document to plan their in-house PD days um, and look ahead to um, scheduling their internal calendars. So I hope that that's a helpful document for you. And let's go to the next slide. Also just want to give folks a heads up that um, we are going to be conducting a statewide professional development survey again this year. Um, that will be open from September 13th to 26th. Um, we hope to keep it as brief as possible and only ask those need to know questions, but things have been uh, undergoing a lot of changes the past couple of years and we do really need to hear from you and your staff about what your current professional development needs are. So thank you so much for taking the time to respond to that when it comes out and for encouraging um, your staff to respond as well. Um, we'll be using the, the data at the statewide professional development committee, as well as all of our advisory groups to plan professional development for the coming year. And then finally, just encourage you to uh, continue the conversation. We want to, uh, provide opportunities for you to network with your colleagues all around the state. We've set up the Minnesota Adult Education Network via Mighty Networks. So if you're not yet on Mighty Networks, um, you'll put a, a link to a newsletter article that will help you get set up. And um, you can join specific groups around um, content or role. Um, and then there's a general uh, news feed as well where you can interact with folks from around the state. Any other professional development questions that I missed, Brad? Or any other no, questions? I think you got everything. Okay, great. I think at this point we will open it up to any general questions. Thank you, Astrid. So if anyone has any questions, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask your question, or you can type your questions in the chat.
while you're thinking of your questions, maybe let's just go to the next slide and remind folks that the recording, the slides, and any handouts will be posted on the Literacy Action Network website. Um, so you can always look there for any uh, for the the last uh, uh, web chat with MNABE or Minnesota Adult Education uh, resources. Uh, and also, if we go to the next slide, just wanted to let you know that the next web chat will be on September 22nd uh, from 1 until 2.30, our normal time. So we'll see you then. Of course, we'll see you at Summer Institute and some other places before then, though, too. And then on the next slide, just want to thank all of you for all of the great work that you've been doing over the last couple of years, over your entire career with adult education. Um, thank you to also to the adult education team at MDE. I'm so glad to be a part of your team. Um, you guys, you all do such outstanding work. And so just thank you all for, for everything. And, um, and we've got another big year ahead of us. And I, I look forward to working with each and every one of you um, out in the field, um, seeing you at regionals um, in the year ahead. So let's go to the final slide and take any final questions folks have. Neil, I think at this point we can end the recording. <laughs>